Hello, I'm Dr. Rick Martin, a family medicine physician at Geisinger. I'd like to spend a few minutes today discussing the significance, recognition, and initial treatment of cellulitis. Cellulitis is a common acute bacterial infection of the skin and soft tissue characterized by an erythematous, painful, and tender area of the skin. Bacteria can spread beyond the dermis into the epidermis and subcutaneous tissues. It may occur following a skin abrasion or minor trauma and may become life-threatening if not managed appropriately. Cellulitis is a common reason for emergency room visits and if left untreated can extend to deeper subcutaneous tissues and cause sepsis. Therefore, it is extremely important that cellulitis be recognized and treated quickly and efficiently once brought to the healthcare professional's attention. Sepsis can occur at any age group but can be particularly serious in the frail elderly. Once symptoms are recognized by the patient or caregiver, access to the office needs to occur as soon as possible. Keep the following in mind as you evaluate and plan treatment. Cellulitis is classified into four clinical categories. Class one and two are considered uncomplicated and can generally be treated in an outpatient setting. Class three and four are considered complicated and require hospitalization for intravenous antibiotics or referral to Geisinger at Home program. Class one and two generally have no signs of systemic toxicity, have no uncontrolled comorbidities such as diabetes, and can usually be managed with oral antimicrobials. Sometimes they have mild systemic symptoms such as low-grade fever, nausea and or vomiting, or a comorbidity such as diabetes or peripheral vascular disease, which may delay the resolution of the infection. Class one patients generally require no labs unless there is purulent drainage or an exudate to be cultured. You may take a photograph using Haiku or at least a measurement of the area of the erythema is advised. They should not receive compression therapy. They should be given appropriate analgesia and appropriate treatment to control their comorbidities. Follow up within 72 hours is advised as well as education about worsening appearance of the erythema over the ensuing several days. Any drainage or exudate should be cultured, however do not culture intact skin. Antibiotics for non-purulent, non-exudative cellulitis should take into consideration the most common culprit organisms, which include beta hemolytic streptococci and methicillin susceptible staph aureus. Appropriate antibiotics would include penicillin VK, 500 milligrams orally every six hours, dicloxacillin, 250 to 500 milligrams orally every six hours, cephalexin, 250 to 500 milligrams orally every six hours, or clindamycin, 300 milligrams orally every six hours. If someone is at additional risk for methicillin resistant staph aureus, consider clindamycin, 300 milligrams orally every six hours, amoxicillin clavulonate, 500 milligrams orally every eight hours, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole orally every 12 hours, or combination treatment with amoxicillin clavulonate 500 milligrams orally every eight hours and doxycycline 100 milligrams orally every 12 hours. It is important to note that clindamycin should be reserved for people who are penicillin or cephalosporin allergic. If oral antibiotics are contraindicated, then cefazolin one gram IV every eight hours, nafcillin two grams every four hours, or clindamycin 600 to 900 milligrams every eight hours intravenously could be administered. For MRSA susceptible patients, vancomycin 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per dose every eight to 12 hours or clindamycin 900 milligrams intravenously every eight hours may be considered. If none of these are appropriate, then an infectious disease consult should be considered for the use of daptomycin, ceftaroline, or linozolid. Parental antibiotics are generally reserved for patients who are immunocompromised, have comorbidities, have signs of systemic toxicity, or are unable to take oral antibiotics. If the cellulitis is purulent and or exudative, but has no drainable abscess, then the following should be considered. 
For those at risk for methicillin resistance, Staph aureus, consider clindamycin, 300 milligrams orally every six hours, or vancomycin, 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose every eight to 12 hours. For those with suspected methicillin susceptible Staph aureus or beta hemolytic strep, then doxycycline, 100 milligrams every 12 hours, or clindamycin, 900 milligrams IV every eight hours should be considered. For those who are immunocompromised or unable to take oral antibiotics, then an infectious disease consult should be requested for consideration of daptomycin, ceftaroline, or linozolid. For culture documented staph aureus, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, one tablet every 12 hours is a consideration. If there is an inadequate response to initial therapy within 72 hours, then ampicillin sublactam, three grams IV every six hours should be administered. If there is inadequate initial response and the patient has risk factors for pseudomonas, then cefepime, two grams IV every 12 hours, piperacillin tazobactam, 3.375 grams IV every eight hours, or meropenem, one gram IV every eight hours should be administered. Those patients with class three cellulitis will have definitive systemic symptoms, including confusion, heart rate greater than 99, respiratory rate greater than 20, systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury, and may have unstable comorbidities that could interfere with response to therapy, such as uncontrolled diabetes, renal or liver failure, or a limb-threatening infection due to vascular compromise. These people should be promptly hospitalized, an infectious disease consultation should be requested, and intravenous antibiotics administered per sepsis protocol. Patients with class four cellulitis have all the above, however, with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury and other features of severe sepsis and life-threatening infections, such as threatened limb loss or necrotizing fasciitis. An important aspect of treatment is to educate the patient about expectations over the first several days of treatment. The erythema will almost always become worse in the first few days. However, in the absence of worsening fever or other systemic symptoms, initial treatment should be maintained and visits to the emergency room should be avoided. Follow-up should occur in two to three days for those with class one or two and seven days or later for those with class three cellulitis. Depending on clinical presentation, frailty, complexity, and or comorbidities, a case management referral may be appropriate as well. Telephonic follow-up is always a good option for status checks and reinforcement of the clinical plan. If cellulitis recurs following an appropriate course of treatment, then an infectious disease consultation may be necessary. In patients who are immunocompromised or have poor circulation, duration of antibiotics may be as long as 14 days. Blood cultures are generally not recommended and are rarely helpful. Erythema of the skin can be caused by other conditions such as vasculitis, deep vein thrombosis, contact dermatitis, lymphedema, venous stasis dermatitis, or others, and should always be kept in mind when confronted by a patient with redness of the skin, particularly those who do not respond to an antimicrobial therapy. We owe it to our patients to keep them healthier and manage their cellulitis more effectively. Thank you for listening. Hopefully this was helpful.